the way I understand the way Starmer and the Labour leadership are dealing with the fact that Corbyn happened, just that it happened, is that this must be relegated to deep history. Everybody must be clear that this can never happen again. Mm. Uh, there is no engagement with why it happened, with the fact that there were actually two general elections. And while Labour lost them both, actually they gained significant ground in 2017, and did particularly well in England in 2017. And then they went down in flames in 2019, and both of those things are true. But... Um, they only want to engage with 2019 and understand this is an unmitigated defeat. The really great thing about doing this job is that sometimes I get to talk to someone who is literally one of the reasons why I'm doing this job at all. Gary Young, the journalist and academic, is one of those people. And I hope you'll get to see all the reasons why he's been such an inspiring and influential figure in my own journalistic work during this interview. We talk about life in Soviet Russia, what Diane Abbott should have said to Jeremy Corbyn, and why the idea of skiing bugs him so much. I mean, did you did you feel that way when you were when you started writing that you because the standard when you're not white and you're not posh and you're not right wing is going to be different um, for you, that it becomes very inhibiting. When I started writing uh, columns particularly, uh, I would spend like 300 words saying, I'm not saying this and I'm not saying this and I'm not saying this and trying to uh, shadow box mm. with all of the... Um, predictable kind of uh, uh, demons and at a certain point and I, I'm, I can't it wasn't an epiphanal point but at a certain point I just thought you've only got 1,200 words and you're going to need to say what you've got to say and this is taking up space and it makes it sound equivocal and you're not equivocal I do think every good column every good piece of writing has to deal with the best argument that confronts it and it has to be an argument otherwise why do it nobody writes like in defense of you know against a murder because nobody really defends murder unless it's war in which case they do so um uh so you have to take on the best arguments but i wasn't taking on the best arguments i was taking on the crazy arguments and the you know and and um the reason i jumped on it when you started talking about it is because it, I think it's a really big thing for uh, for the sake of for the sake of this conversation I'm going to call minoritized writers so mm. they don't have to be black or or Asian or it, it could be that you're working class and there just aren't that many people like you when there aren't that many people like you and that feeling and I you know, I know it from um, uh, from a racialized and class experience that um, I don't want to be thought of as X, and I don't want to be thought of as X. I don't want to be mistaken. And there was a realization that well, then you're just giving all of the power to somebody else to define you, define yourself, and then let them deal with it. And more people are capable of dealing with it than you would imagine, as it turns out. I think for me, the final, the thing I find difficult is finding a place of healthy self-doubt mm. because self-doubt's a really important thing and it's the thing which stress tests your arguments and it's the thing which stops you from making huge clanging errors, hopefully, because you go, oh, I doubt myself, so let me mm. double, triple check, and then becoming paralyzed by it. Mm. And I very often end up in that place of paralysis because I'm so scared of being wrong yeah yeah and being scared of being wrong is a good thing and the the, the point is the two of them together healthy self-doubt healthy it's got to be healthy not kind of um uh cowardly would be the wrong sense but not cowering self-doubt and or paralyzing self that all of those things, and there's no way to police these things but what we see when the people who don't have this experience, right, 
is how bad journalism can be when you don't have self-doubt, when you, when you know, you just know what's going to happen. Corbyn has been elected leader of the Labour Party. We know what's going to happen now. And I'm like, well, how do you know? I don't know. He doesn't know. Nobody knows. And um, so, so, I mean, self-doubt is really important. And struggling with it is, I mean, it's a life's work. I still struggle with it. Like, it's, it's, it's good. It's good for you to be worried and to think, is that really what I mean? You know, it's why a good editor Mm. is is a great thing you should because we shouldn't be doing these things on our own anyway and so to have someone who says D -d -d do you mean that or do you, or maybe you mean something else and even if you don't mean what they think you might mean it forces you to just engage so um but there's a difference between doubting your subject and doubting the context in which you're writing Right, so that the thing where you're worried that someone will think this about you, or someone will think that about you, or they will do this to you. First of all, you don't control it. Uh, um, secondly, that's not a doubt about what you're writing. That's a doubt about the the world it goes into, which is not insignificant, but is not maybe the most important thing in a sense to be worried about. But also over time, and this is where just being old helps, <laughs> they come for you anyway. Mm. They come for you anyway. You can caveat, you can mitigate it, you can, you know, you can do, you know, you can do the whole ninja thing. They're still going to come for you. Then it's not like they're going to say, oh, well, you know, fair enough. Yeah, I can see that he's engaged with all of these arguments. Um, and so you, we've only got so much time on the planet and it's important that we say what we need to say while we're here and don't get wrapped, wrapped up in trying to counter the nonsense. Some of it is sense, but actually most of it is nonsense. What's the most useful critique that you've ever received on your writing? The most useful critique... Is is probably the the most consistent. Like, do do you mean that? Or if you're think if, unless you're talking about a specific, like I wrote one thing and then somebody said, mm, do you, is that what you mean? Like a specific critique on a specific piece. Um, there've been so many. I'm gonna have to come back to you. <laughs> I'm gonna have to come back to you on that. But I mean, a good editor is hard to find. Mm. And uh, what, one recent one, I don't know that it's the best one, but one recent one was um, I was writing this piece about how it's not amnesia, colonial, colonial amnesia. They don't forget. They actually work very hard at not remembering, which is a different thing. Uh, and amnesia is a kind of passive, much more passive state. You don't forget that you enslaved millions of people and colonized huge numbers, like you forget an umbrella or something. You don't. And the editor I had, Jonathan Shanin, he said, it's a good point, but I need you to kind of engage with why it matters. Mm. Why should we care? Like, And he wasn't saying it doesn't matter. He was saying, like, you know, journalism and books are full of, here's a thing you didn't know, but quite often they don't exactly tell you why you should care. And um, we, we're going to need that too, you know. Uh, that, you know, that was like, um, uh, in a sense, I been so dedicated to the excavation that uh, um, it slightly eluded me what the excavation was for. You is know. the is the difference between something that's purposeful and driven and something that's noodling? And there yeah. is there is a place for noodling yeah. in writing, but actually maybe not when you talk about slavery. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and, and it's not like there wasn't a point, or that I didn't have a point. But then I had to kind of work. Yeah, what am I trying to do with this? You know. When I think about a good editor, I always think of um, Ezra Pound's edits of The Wasteland. Mm -hmm. So Ezra Pound, obviously, big, big bastard, fascist, um, 
did some terrible propagandizing for Mussolini's Italy. And you love him. And I love him so much. You want to kiss him. Uh, Because I read the piece you wrote. I know. It's the the perfect poem. (laughs) It is. um, It is in a station of the metro. These apparitions, faces in the crowd, petals on a wet black bow. Perfect poem. (laughs) Sorry. It's not my fault he's a fascist. I'd rather he wasn't. (laughs) But it's a perfect poem. Um, And his edits of The Wasteland, you, you can get the facsimile edition of it. And The Wasteland in T.S. Eliot's original writing was so much baggier. And there's all this kind of exposition. He's doing all this explaining. And Ezra Pound just takes a ruler and crosses it out. And I think for me, that has been a constant reminder of the difference between defensive and propositional Mm. writing. And that so much of it is just going, don't explain that. It's just here. And obviously with poetry, it's a different thing. And you have to do a bit more explaining with journalism. But it was the the bravery to go, it's just here. Yeah. There's something, I, I think often, this works as well romantically as it does artistically. There's something about confidence that mm. is incredibly attractive. And that um, about kind of someone approaching a keyboard or a piece of paper, whatever it is, and saying, to the best of my knowledge, with all the caveats about my imperfections, this is what I want to say. This is what I want to say. This is what I want you to hear. Uh, that is incredibly powerful. And that kind of, we have to be open to the possibility, likelihood even at certain points, that we might be wrong as well. That there's worse things than being wrong, being stupid, being uh, uh, being mean, uh, being vile, um, uh, making ad hominem. There are many, many worse things than being wrong. And actually, um, you know, <laughs> and I don't mean morally wrong. I mean kind of somehow just not quite seeing everything. That kind of we are, we, you know, we are in the moment. We are where we are. So we can only make as much sense of what we what we have. So there will be, you know, we will miss things. And that's kind of that's okay. I mean, your background before journalism was that you were a translator and you're working with French and Russian. Did you mm. ever consider espionage? <laughs> well, I trained to be a translator uh in French and Russian. And I did some translation work for a bit. And then actually I came into The Guardian in a project, it's funny to think of this now, because I graduated in 1992, the year of the Single European Act. I was born in 1992. Yeah, see, I hate it when people do that, you know. (laughs) Even the very, very charming, well, you said, I saw you speak when I was 14. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, that just makes me feel old. I mean, I should feel... Um, gr- grateful. <laughs> I just, I was born in 1992. So, <laughs> like, I would reach over this table. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so I graduated in 1992, which was the year of the Single European Act. And um, The Guardian had recently launched this thing called Guardian Europe, which was, it had partnerships with lots of different papers, Le Monde, Nezavisima Gazeta in Russia, um, Süddeutsche Zeitung. And they needed people to come in every day and read those papers and find stories that would be relevant. And it was part of this great new European world that we were entering. And um, uh, and I could help with French, Russian and German. And so uh, I didn't study German. I studied German at A-level and then switched to Russian. So... Um, that's how I got got in there. So I, 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 you know, I did a bit of translation. I never thought of espionage because I was never considered being on the wrong side. Um, <laughs> or I guess I, I guess I could have spied for the Soviets. Although, who's going to let me near any British secrets? <laughs> so, um, um, so no, never got to spy. Did get to live in what was Leningrad for six what months. What was that like? Was and how was mental. the reality of it compared to your expectations of it? It was, um, 
as a as a kind of lived experience, it was hard. It was very hard. I still had the there were ration cards and um, uh, and they were kind of a little bit useless because you could either buy the stuff or you couldn't buy the stuff. Um, it was clearly on its last legs. Um, Gorbachev was very unpopular. This was 1991. Um, America was very popular, which shaped my experience in a way that I'll describe in a little bit. It was America just won the first Iraq war. So that it was the kind of height of this notion that there was going to be a unipolar world dominated by America and uh, neoliberal globalization. And people, I remember one conversation that really stayed with me and uh, educated me, which was talking to a Russian woman. She was saying how much she would rather live in America. And I said, well, you know, in America, they, they don't have health care. Whereas here, you can, you know, you, you can go to the doctors, you can go to the hospital. And she said, have you been to our hospitals? Like, and it was like, okay, yeah, fair enough. <laughs> yeah, if the state provides things, they have to be decent, they have to be good. And that, like, there was no, I didn't spend the time lecturing Russians on why the Soviet Union was good. I wasn't that stupid. But um, I, I remember that as being like, you know, would you rather live in a place with no health care or with health care that is terrible, that is really bad and where bribery is kind of, you know, part of, the main, you know, just how you do things. I lived with a family because I was the only, languages are dominated by uh, women. And so I was the only guy. So the women were in uh, student hostels and I stayed with a, um, a Jewish mum and her son. So I had a quite a different experience to everyone else. And so it was hard. I remember her crying because she couldn't find, she couldn't find socks. All of his socks had worn out. Uh, Ilya would have been maybe 10 or 11. All of his socks were worn out. It was cold. And uh, um, and she'd spent like a day and a half looking for socks and there was just no socks. Um, so it was really hard. And as a 21, 22-year-old, um, I had a ball. because First of all, because I was only there for six months. I had Western currency. My Russian stipend was about five, six quid a month. So just with 20 or 30 quid, you could do a lot of damage as a kind of young person in terms of kind of alcohol and food and whatever, you know, whatever else you wanted to do. So there was that. Um, it was also the only time ever in my life that I've been associated with wealth. People looked at me and they thought, you're rich. And this was because um, uh, at a time that I don't think has been replicated since, America was dominant and uh, uh, represented aspiration. And somehow they looked at me, I had plats at the time, sneakers, and they didn't see an African or a Cuban. If they had, it would have been very, very different because they were still catching hell and still associated actually with Soviet follies of the past. Whereas American was considered wealthy. And I looked, I, in their mind, there are black Russians, not that many, but in their mind, I couldn't be Russian and I didn't look African. It was all very subtle, but it was all quite instant. I must be American. And I was mostly, hang, well, I was hanging around with, you know, white people who spoke English. And so... The previous six months I've been in Paris, which was the most intense racist experience of my life. I was beaten up by the cops. I couldn't find a place to stay for ages. I was stopped and searched probably three, four times a week. It was horrible. Was it worse than Leningrad? Well, no, Leningrad was cars. In Paris, I couldn't get a cab, even at a stand. Cabs would go, I'm not taking you. In Leningrad cars would stop and turn into taxis for me because they assumed I had dollars. So just, where do you want to go? You know, there'd be someone with, it was like Flintstone Uber. <laughs> someone with their kids in the car, just like, where do you want to go? I'll take you. Like you. I had to vouch for white people. If we were going somewhere 
where it was kind of, you know, they wanted to know that you had the money. They looked at me and they just thought, money? I know, I've got a lot more money now than I did then, but like nobody looks at me now and thinks, <laughs> thinks you must be rich. But in that particular moment in uh, Leningrad, I was associated with, um, I was understood to be, people looked at me and thought, well, he's rich. I mean, um, I think this is something which, not being black, I can't understand the experience of is that black people are kind of the engine of American pop culture. And so a lot of what people learn about black people is via American yeah. media, music, sports. Mm. Yeah, so you're constantly, um, and I used to bristle at it and then I just kind of leaned into it, is that you were constantly being mistaken for being American. So I... I worked for a year in Sudan in, uh, in a refugee school and the assumption, if the assumption wasn't that I was African, it would be that I was American. Once again, from kind of presentation. And it's not like the presentation was indifferent either because of course it was Britain in the, uh, then in the 80s. So it's not like America had no influence on how we dressed or how we looked. But that presence that America has, which, you know, or black America has, which obviously I'm not complaining that black Americans have done anything wrong, but the power of America, economic, cultural, whatever, political, means that we did, in a range of ways, it it was like a, a, a big weight so, you know, I was much more familiar with African-American literature than I was with black, black British literature until the mid-20s, my mid-20s. Um, much more familiar with uh, African-American politics. Uh, my first book about traveling through the Deep South was about, was, was prompted by the power of the imagery of the civil rights movement had on me. And I knew much more about all of that than I did about colonialism, about my knowledge of Nkrumah, Cabral, um, uh, South Africa came earlier, but all of the others, um, they all came much later because black America was just so much more accessible than black Britishness. So, there, you know, there's long been, I think, this it's not a tricky relationship, but it is something to navigate um, um, when it comes to the kind of power of Black America on our imaginations. Um, I, I want to come back to the question of America in a bit, but to stick with um, the Soviet Union for a second, one of the things which I've um, I've seen you talk about is that this Soviet connection meant that you kind of got in with like Nelson Mandela's entourage on the yeah. eve of the first democratic election in South mm. Africa. How did that happen? Yeah, when when you tell people, yeah, I studied in the Soviet Union, it was like, really? And it does open up these kind of interesting things. So uh, I was sent to South Africa to cover the first election. Um, I couldn't drive, which... Yeah, I couldn't ski either. It wasn't a kind of it wasn't a thing until I arrived in South Africa and you really have to drive to kind of get about. And I'm following Mandela on his campaign trail is one of the things that I've been asked to do. And so I get lifts with people and I pay them and you know, for money and conversation. So often they'll take you one place and they couldn't get back, you know, and then you find a lift back. So I can't remember where we'd gone. But then I needed to get back and someone took me some of the way and said, I'm going to drop you at this gas station. There's some people coming later. They will, um, they'll pick you up. And it was um, his bodyguards who had been, well, they'd been working. And um, I amused them, you know, and I made it my business to amuse them, to be fair. But um, I... I'd been involved in the anti-apartheid movement from the age of 15, picking this African embassy with my mum on a uh, Friday night. You might have encountered my mum getting nicked. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, she got nicked twice. <laughs> um, you know, I think 
I think CND was my first demonstration, but I went on, I, I'd been involved in the anti-apartheid movement and I'd set up an anti-apartheid society at university and so there was that. And then I'd studied in the Soviet Union, as had they. As a journalist, they just didn't think I was going to run off and, you know, start writing weird stuff about them. So they were like, you just come along. So after that one trip where, you know, I broke the monotony for them a little bit. And so then they would just let me kind of, you know, just go with them. And, that, you know, I would know where they were staying. So I'd book myself in the same hotel. And uh, so I was, kind of, I stumbled into this. I was 24, 25, 24 when I arrived, 25 when the election happened. And I stumbled into this incredibly intimate proximity with uh, with the big man himself. And without really knowing what to do with it, which is good, actually, which w was helpful because I all I did was observe. And then I wrote the piece that got me my job uh, called The Black Knight, which is the first piece in the book. Um, but, um, yeah, it's one of those... Uh, unintended consequence things where I'm doing all this stuff, not thinking this will benefit me in some way. Um, everybody, you know, the counselors at school said, don't study Russian. Glasnost hadn't even started yet. You know, don't study Russian because what are you going to do with that? Um, uh, but I wanted to. Um, Anti-apartheid society, you know, nobody's thinking that that is going to be the route to some kind of career breaking. Um, and yeah, it all kind of it all kind of fell into place when in the moment. When you first started in the anti-apartheid movement, did you think that you would see apartheid fall? That's a good question. I I would have been like fifteen, and I th I think I thought it had to. That would have been my that would have been my view at the time is that g good and right things have to happen. You know, I remember having an argument with someone and saying, uh, after the 1987 crash, uh, economic crash and saying, well, capitalism cannot continue like this. And he said, yeah, it can. Uh, which at the time I thought, can it? Surely not. You know, and anyway, here we are. So, um, uh, so I think at the age of fifteen, I thought, well, this, you know, obviously this is wrong. This can't continue. And there were enough. The wind was against it by then, and even though, like, the British government wasn't against it, and that there were, uh, it was becoming part of the common sense. Um, it wasn't a particularly radical thing to be involved in the anti-apartheid movement. Um, at, by the time I joined, it just felt like a very necessary thing. I mean, my mum talks about the moment of Mandela being released from prison as a miracle because she talks about how unexpected it felt. She felt that it was just like, it's this movement, she was a part of it because it was morally right, but she didn't think that anything would, would happen. And then suddenly it just... Did. Yeah, and my guess is, uh, I'm 54, that I'm probably around the same generation as your mum. Yeah, she's a little older. I won't say how, how much older, because otherwise she'll <laughs> yes. throttle me. But um, you also have to remember that we, Thatcher came in when I was 10. The miners' strike, uh, the miners went down to defeat in 84, I was 15. There had been very few victories. We had been kind of, um, this was the collapse of the kind of, you know, Fordist order, the uh, crushing of the trade union movement. Um, it had been a very hard time politically, and it had been my formative time, which is why I think there are so many people of around my age who um, are in the opinion game, who kind of, share my politics because it was it was defeat after defeat after defeat and so Mandela's release was this stunning um uh victory albeit as most victories are kind of mitigated through negotiation and so but it was like a rare win 
a rare win. And I have a sense, maybe this is because I'm slightly younger than your mum, of thinking, well, this had to happen. And feeling really glad that I felt, not, not that I had made it happen, but I, that I'd been part of something that had actually finally won. I mean, you, you start at The Guardian in what, 94? Well, in 93, I start with the translation, but I get a job in 94. And so this is really like end of history era, right? Yeah. Neoliberal consensus has been secured. Uh, Soviet Union has fallen. It's, you know, good times and corporate social responsibility forever mm. now, baby. Um, what was it like internally at The Guardian during that time? Did it feel like a victory and a march towards progress for people there or were there people who were like this isn't stable this can't last oh there were all you know the guardian was always a coalition of paul foot used to have a column there when i started um seamus milne was the labor editor i think or um i think labor editor they call it or trade union editor um, you know, there were lefties there. There are lefties there. There were always lefties there. Owen Jones clinging on by his fingernails, like on the Sorry? door frame. <laughs> Owen just like... <laughs> well, so there were kind of... Um, um, so there were some people who... Well, there were some people who stood as uh, SDP people. So there were people on, on that wing... And then, you know, there were people like um, uh, Seamus. And um, just because Seamus has become almost like a meme now, but there there were a group of people, I don't mean that condescendingly about him, I just mean the weird way he has been depicted and treated, but Richard Norton Taylor, Duncan Campbell, you know, there were a range of uh, uh, left-wing voices there. George Monbiot was already kind of, you know, in the mix. So um, it wasn't like, and, and I wasn't writing opinion, right? I didn't write opinion for another kind of five years. But um, uh, occasionally I did. But Dip to toe. So, yes. But um, uh, so it was kind of, you know, it was, it was fine, really. I mean, how did you look at the program of neoliberalism globalization european integration did you at all feel optimistic about it or were you looking at that with a degree of suspicion no, consternation? I, yeah no i didn't look at it optimistically at all like i i i remember on election on the day after election day the sun is shining blair has won um and one of my colleagues says and this isn't him being a patsy, it's just a, he said, should we get a cab down and see, because Blair was walking down the mall or something. Anyway, it was a real, it was a, it was a moment. And I just felt completely alienated from it. And I remember just saying, no, you're good. You know, you know, you're all right. Um, uh, which wasn't me being churlish. I just, I just didn't feel it as a moment of celebration. I felt it. When they won in 97, I felt it was a moment of relief. The Tories are gone. And of possibility, because these people will respond to pressure in a different way. But I didn't feel like it was my victory. I didn't feel like it was, you know, uh, it, wasn't the, it wasn't the victory I had wanted. Uh, but I can nevertheless see it as a victory of sorts, or at least a defeat of sorts a defeat of the worst. I mean, does the Blair era offer lessons for how leftists can or ought to relate to Keir Starmer? I don't think it does, actually. And the reason it doesn't is because in between that time, there's been Corbyn. And Corbyn, the way I understand, the way I understand the way Starmer and the Labour leadership are dealing with the fact that Corbyn happened, just that it happened, is that this must be relegated to deep history. Everybody must be clear that this can never happen again. Mm. Uh, there is no engagement with why it happened, 
with um, uh, the fact that there were actually two general due two general elections and while Labour lost them both actually they gained significant ground in 2017 and did particularly well in England in 2017 and then they went down in flames in 2019 and both of those things are true but um, they only want to engage with 2019 and understand this is an unmitigated defeat and uh, disaster and that it's happened. The notion that anyone like Corbyn could be leader of the Labour Party during the Blair era was, in fact, would have been a fantasy. And so they, all of that group of people could be tolerated in a way that they are clearly not. There's something like a jihad, really, mm. against the left that defies electoral common sense, actually. Like, you could leave Jeremy Corbyn in his constituency where he's very popular uh, and people will know that he was a leader of the Labour Party and they will have moved on. Or you could try and deselect him and remove him from the Labour Party and have a whole drama around his seat and the possibility of him standing against the Labour candidate and all of that. And you could relive those... Now... The first one passes by with almost that incident. The second one actually revives the notion of Labour as a split party, as a, uh, uh, it, relies, it revives memories of Corbyn for anyone who was traumatised by that. It does uh, so. It doesn't have an electoral logic um, any more than a jihad does, but that that's um, um, to kind of consign the Labour Party left to not just the dustbin of the of history but of the future that this this can never happen again so um th that demands a reckoning I think on the left which wouldn't have been true during Blair's era which is um is this party actually fit for our purpose was the energy that we put into this over those uh, four years, was it worthwhile? What did we gain? What did we lose? If we look at the trauma, I'm not, and I don't have the answer to these questions, but I think they are reasonable questions. Um, um, was this the most effective use of our time and energy during that uh, period? What did we win and what did we lose? And I mean, a lot was proven. A lot was proven was that it was possible and that there was, there, you know, with a fairly boilerplate social democratic agenda was you could attract large numbers of people. Um, uh, but I think it, it would be delusional to say that where we are now is really where we want it to be, which is different from saying whether it was a good idea or not. But that's what we did and this is where we are. I mean, one of the things I've seen you talk about is that being a black and working class writer, you were taught from an early age that you had to distinguish between appearances and reality. Mm. Um, do you think that everyone did a good job of doing that with Corbyn? No, I I think very few people did. And I think very, pe very few people for, in different ways and did with different consequences on the left and the right did. I was... I was just coming back from America when Corbyn was elected in 2015. So I hadn't seen the kind of, the transformation. Um, it seemed highly unlikely, you know. <laughs> I was in America packing up my stuff and getting ready to go. When Corbyn was made to stand for his job again, which always seemed like a particularly ridiculous thing for Labour to do to itself, really, um, against a man whose name very few people can even remember now. Um, I I followed him because I, I interviewed him, so I went to three meetings. And what I was shocked by was how um, unideological his base was. His base, not, you know, 
his base in the commentariat or his Twitter supporters. Mm. But you'd go to these meetings. I remember one woman saying, well, if there's someone better, I'd vote for them. And it was as easy as that. It was like, you know, I remember a guy, I can't remember where it was. He was like, I think we're just Labour needs to get back to a bit more like what it was like, you know. And Blair did some good things. And then there was Iraq and that wasn't so good. And I think Jeremy is more like the Labour that we want. And it wasn't, I went to three meetings in Dundee, in Romford and somewhere else. So he's not kind of um, places where you, you could just kind of um, dismiss the people as being, you know, part of some construct or another. And um, I didn't hear neoliberal globalization mentioned once. I didn't hear intersectionality mentioned <laughs> once. I only heard socialism mentioned a couple of times. Jeremy was usually the least good speaker on most stages and got an enthusiastic but um, restrained, really, response. And it was, um, and that's not a complaint, it's just a description of a kind of um, a desire for reorientation is what I saw. And that it came, it, it came in the form of Jeremy because pretty much every other form had been extinguished and had become indistinguishable from each other. Um, and and that's what we've gone back to. And the one thing I was genuinely intrigued by when I got back was I thought, oh, I wonder how the Blairite crew, I wonder how that group of um, commentators and actors how they understand this, how they understand that this man and his agenda have become popular. And it was really shocking to me, and it remained shocking to me, that they had no interest in understanding it. They Actually, they were quite determined not to understand it. The idea was just that it shouldn't happen. It shouldn't happen, then it happened, then it shouldn't have happened. We will try and reverse what happened. Uh, and then they couldn't. And then when 2017 happened and Labour did much better than expected, then they were like, well, that shouldn't have happened either. And I don't understand why that happened. And then when 2019 happened, they were like, see? You know, and he was like a witch. So if he floated, then he was a witch and they were going to burn him. And if he drowned, then he wasn't a witch. Do you know what I mean? So he had to, he had to lose in order for them to be confirmed. And that could have gone on for years. It was like a broken clock. This is kind of, you know, these people who had said, Labour's gonna go down in flames, every by-election, every local council election, every, every single time, and they hadn't. And then once they did, that I see, it was like, yeah, broken clock is right twice a day. Congratulations. I mean, there's, an aspect of Jeremy Corbyn's leadership, which I think has gone curiously under-examined, because obviously the only real voters are swing voters and a handful mm. of constituencies, and everyone else electorally may as well be dead. But it was that um, for a lot of people of colour, particularly working class people of colour, there was a kind of affinity. Mm. And you'd sort of see it when he's like walking around Holloway. Mm. And there was a feeling, and you saw it when you know, a couple of people would be stupid enough to say this out loud, that he was too close to the wrong ethnicities. Right. And my theory is that Jeremy Corbyn is, you know, the first white atheist victim of Islamophobia. <laughs> yeah, now there is a version of, which I would, uh, which I was never going to do um, journalistically, but I recall, um, it's before your time, Tony Morrison's... Uh, description of Clinton during the Lewinsky thing as our first black president mm -hmm. and that they're, they're treating him like he's black and there was this element to to the way that Jeremy was treated where he's like dude you don't have any benefit of the doubt you, d d you there are no benefits for you you are who you are who we say you are and you will be wrong in whatever way we choose for you to be wrong and one of the things that uh, and this I did write that I <laughs> I wanted I wanted Diane 
to give him the stern love of a Caribbean mother, <laughs> the, the love that I had, which was my mum's like, don't come home and complain to me about uh, racism at your school, about deal with it. You were going to have to deal with this stuff. So, and not brilliant parenting in a range of ways, you know, but like, um, you have to find a way to navigate this because the world is full of people who were quite right, this is my mum talking, in complaining about how badly they've been treated and they're, and they're still suffering. So if you don't want to suffer, you have to find a way through it. You have to find a way around it. You have to deal with it. But don't come home to me complaining about it like you think that there's something I can do about this thing because there really is a limit to what I can do. My mum stuck up for me in a range of ways. It wasn't completely brutal, but there was that element to it. And I felt like someone needed to be saying that to to Jeremy constantly. You have to be better. It's not good enough for you to be good. You have to be better because they're coming for you. And so the media are mean to me. You know, crying to your pillow, get up and find a way to be better. Because the cruel reality is this world doesn't, or this world that you have injected yourself into, this high political culture, well, it doesn't want you. And so you're going to have to find a way to kind of um, uh, deal with that. Uh, and it's not fair. And it shouldn't, as in the same way that my, you know, whatever racist teachers I have shouldn't be let off the hook, doesn't let the media off the hook, doesn't let anybody else off the hook. It's just a kind of urgent reality of this of this moment which is don't come complain to me about how awful everybody is because we kind of knew that going in and um um and it's so it's a form of, it's a form of uh uh of tough love and i do feel that now coming back to your original question about things we can learn i feel like the left is Tra traumatized mm. for well, I think kind of everybody uh, in different ways is traumatized, but I feel like the left is traumatized, has been traumatized by this experience. People who joined because they cared about inequality and so on, and they suddenly find themselves either expelled or branded an anti Semite, and they're kind of wondering, you know, how did that happen? And um, uh, they have people leading the party who were saying, I'm glad that, the, that those people have left this kind of really kind of Stalinist sense of like that never happened. And to the extent that it did happen, it was just a horrible mistake. Uh, so there's a real, I think there's a, a real trauma. And as is often the case when trauma is afoot, the possibility of kind of self-harm, a kind of rage that is understandable, and maybe not particularly healthy. I mean, I, I look back on that period of time and there's all kinds of things I regret. Like I've got a list as long as my arm about all the things that I regret, all the things that I did that were crappy, all the things that I didn't do that I should have. Um, and when I'm particularly hormonal, it's like, you know, I'll be talking to my partner and start crying. And he's just like, why are you crying about something that happened in 2017? It's like, because I am. <laughs> um, how do you deal with political trauma? Like, how do you recover from it? How do you become a useful political actor again? Or do you just have to go, I'm on, I'm on the scrap heap of political actors now. I'm too damaged to go again. Oh, right. Well, you know, you, I think quite often people have to take a break. They, have to, they do have to take a break and um, learn to know themselves more moderately, you know, um, have a cocktail. Uh, hang out with your friends, read some fiction, just take a bit of a take a bit of a time out, and um, and then and then kind of I think there's this, there is some internal work. <laughs> what was I? What did I want to happen? What there are no guarantees when you fight. There are no guarantees that you'll win. There's just a guarantee that if you don't win, if you don't fight, you can't win. That's the only guarantee. And that these, I remember Ronan Bennett talking to me. Uh, he's a, a writer from Northern Ireland, uh, Catholic, 
who was wrongly imprisoned in Longkesh for murder, uh, uh, released, became a brilliant novelist and um, uh, screenwriter. And I was talking to him when Obama won. I was talking to him about the impact of black America on the north of Ireland and elsewhere. And he's and he was talking about Soledad Brother, I think, George Jackson's uh, autobiography. An incredible, incredible book. Yes, really incredible book. And he, he said, it was when I read that that I realised that these things weren't happening to me personally. And I'd stop feeling sorry for myself. Which is hard, right? You're in, you're in prison for a murder that you didn't do in long cash in what I'm assuming is the 80s. This is not a good time to be there with that, that I have to understand this as structurally. And that's, I mean, I think that is kind of often the challenge is to kind of understand your, these things are happening to me personally because I am a person but they are happening structurally. They are taking place structurally. They are kind of, and which is why you need some a little bit of distance from the structure to see what the structure is, I think. Um, and then start back small, I think. Start back with um, a campaign, a, you know, a thing that you, something local or something specific. Um, you know, and there's no, you know, rejoin the Labour Party, don't rejoin the Labour but those are all kind of strategic questions that people um, uh, have to answer for themselves. I, re I remember being in Labour students and being horribly treated uh, after I won an election that I wasn't supposed to win. Slightly, <laughs> slightly kind of mini-me Corbynish, but before... Yeah, you got Jeremy. I got Jer I did, I got very jeremy uh, And concluding, uh, this was for me, I will be involved in this election, 92, um, because, I, because I believe what I said, you know, that a Labour... A, even a Labour government under Kinnock at that point would be better than what we have. And we've had this for so long and so so forth. Of course, by the time we got to 97, it was so much, it was so much worse. But in 92, I will do this. But if we lose, then I'm out because I've just exhausted fighting my own side. And I think that there are more useful things I can do with my time. And I don't, I just... Um, so I stayed in the party until then. And it was difficult staying in this party that had treated me so awfully. Um, and, um, but it, there was a kind of, there was enough logic in it for me. Ultimately, what I'm saying is that as hard as it is, particularly when the attacks are personal, the challenge is to not take it personally, but to understand it as political and to understand it as structural and to see if you can divorce yourself, your personal you and your structural you, which is a big ask. I mean, I want to move on a bit to America, a country that you've traveled very widely in, a place that you've written about an awful lot. Um, what are the really big differences in terms of racial dynamics between the states and the UK? There are a few. I would say um, the first is that in Britain, black people have been here in large number less long. Uh, whereas in black America, um, since 1652, there's been a significant and growing black population actually even before then, but, um, uh, and time can translate into institutions, uh, but it also translates into an, a, an affinity. So, uh, and this is in flux in Britain, but certainly I have an affinity to Barbados, which is where my parents are from, um, that black Britain remains a more cosmopolitan space with attachments to Africa, Caribbean, and where 
people's parents or grandparents were from. Whereas um, uh, Black Americans, African Americans in particular, can't actually say with any specificity where they were from, first of all. So they don't have that kind of the flag that you can wave a Notting Hill Carnival kind of thing. Uh, they have an African American flag, but that in itself tells you a story. Uh, but also, in many ways, and C.R. Jones pointed this out, makes them very American. Uh, there are a range of ways of being an American, and this is one of them. So uh, there's that. Um, there is a, cl- a significant class um, uh, differences within black America. If you go to areas of Atlanta, there is a huge African-American middle class. Um uh, same in New York, Maryland. Most cities will have a significant uh, uh, black middle class. Um, that's moneyed. Um, we don't really have that. We are we. There was a time when I was growing up when I would have said we actually don't really have much class stratification at all. But now, I think we do. I'm not sure that I would yet say that there is a black British middle class. There are black British middle class people. I don't know that that is yet a class. It might be. And there's no no one's going to come and <laughs> give you a stamp. But we're, we're on our way there. But I don't know that as a class it exists. I guess you've got, you don't have the same institutions. So you don't have um, historically black colleges and there's, universities. Yes, yeah, sort of fraternities, yeah. sororities, um the you know the uh, the one that always struck me was the National Black Skiers Association. Skiers. Yeah, just a, uh, which has been around for years and years, and which you know is a, a a large number of black people who like skiing together with other black people. What is it with you and skiing? Why is it the <laughs> idea of skiing has it's such a power symbol? Over you? It's a it's a symbol of a kind of class difference to me of like oh you you know, which is very British, right? If you're I don't know, Italian or Austrian, probably everyone can ski. Finland, it's not a big deal, but like <laughs> you need money to ski. Um, uh, but yes, it is a bit of an obsession. Um, so there's that. There's significant class differentials. Uh, and um, finally, there is a number, you know, that we are, uh, if we're just talking of black or African descent, about five, six percent of the population. African Americans, about thirteen percent of the population. A significantly higher proportion if you go to some of the swing states, Georgia, North Carolina, and so on. Um so um it's a bigger community that's been there longer with richer people in it. Um uh and that also speaks to uh, institutions now to, just to give a sense of how that works in um well and i should also say while you can't because there's no welfare state in britain there are a few people who have risen as high there are also fewer people who have fallen as far as um you know the african-american underclass and if you look at mortality rates you know black man in dc is a worse life expectancy than a man on the Gaza Strip. Infant mortality for black kids in Chicago is around the same as West Bank. I mean, it's bad. Unsheltered housing. Yes, exactly. All, all of all of that. So we... Um, two ways to kind of describe that. One would be in my... my uh, wife is African-American. Um, wow, cross-continental marriage. <laughs> she... I think he's a fourth generation, um, part of her family's light skin from Louisiana, fourth generation university educated, fourth or fifth. As soon as our universities were open, her light skin people were like right in there, like right. Are you really married up? Yes, you I did. You really married yes, up? Yes, I did. Um, uh, and, you know, I remember being at a barbecue at her house and her brother going, so, Someone going for an interview and her brother saying, oh, I know somebody, it was barbecue with black folk, I know somebody who um, works there 
um, shall I give them a call? And I thought, see, that's what a class is. That's what a class can do. Uh, um, the, the very obvious thing that I've forgotten, of course, is that one of the very big differences is that black America had segregation mm. on its soil and it had its civil rights movement on its soil. And so America, in a way, black and white, is educated or miseducated, but nonetheless, no American would ever claim, however crazy, there was no segregation or it wasn't involved in segregation or it wasn't involved in slavery. They might say, get over it, or it doesn't matter. Or... So it was all of that. Whereas most of our kind of key civil rights movements took place abroad, India, Ghana, uh, um, wherever, and that distance has allowed a kind of um, uh, an indifference, uh, a studied, um, energetic forgetfulness that America just can't get away with. Uh, and so there's that too. So there is the kind of, my wife's parents were in Jack and Jill, which was a ref you could only get in by reference only black only um parents and toddlers group so it was middle class because you could only get in because somebody else said you could go uh and um uh and black only and that kind of said so that notion of black only institutions is and and of black nationalism is far stronger there and so one of the other reasons why a black middle class wouldn't quite work in the same way here is because there's such high levels of uh, interracial relationships, which mm. is, I think, a, is a thing. It's not, I don't see it as a necessarily good or bad thing, but it's a thing. Like, I think virtue can be attached to that in ways that are unhealthy. But um, it does speak to more social integration than they have there and um uh and a greater kind of fluidity around issues of of race so one reason that we wouldn't have a black middle class is because quite a lot of the black middle class people would be there with their white mm. partners in a way that would be less true in america even though it's growing i mean something which i've noticed in recent years is that there has been an attempt to recreate some of those middle class social spaces for black and brown people here. So I'm thinking about particular brunches or even an organized ski trip. Mm. Um, so there is this sort of sense of trying to learn from America and bring it here. Mm. And as you have that kind of class stratification a bit more, you know, over the last few decades for black and brown people in this country, a way of going, well, we can have some of those experiences. We can create maybe some of those institutions on a very small scale. Yeah, and, you know, um, there's a lot that's good about America and a lot that's not, you know. And um, that wouldn't be my scene, particularly, to try... The skiing. The skiing in particular, I am against. That is my <laughs> own personal jihad, is the skiing. No, the, the, a kind of um, uh, a class-based... Um, kind of hermetically sealed uh, comfort zone is not kind of, is not really what I'm looking for. Um, and, you know, some of the things that people want are based on also what other white people here have. Like, well, why can't we do that? And some of them are just what they want, you know, like I'm, I, I try not to be too, apart from skiing, obviously, try not to be too overly judgmental about uh, 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 about these things. But it's a truism and has long been, long been, that we're not America, that there are elements of black American politics and culture that... Uh, can be emulated and that in my opinion there are some that make sense and some that don't you know and um, when African Americans used to ask me which is quite often so where would be where would you rather be you like as a black person and I had this formulation 
which as time goes on, works less and less well for reasons that become clear. That look, I'm one of three boys raised by a single mum. In America, that already means one of us would statistically probably be in jail or dead by the early 20s. Uh, my mother was a nocturnal epileptic. She got the medicine she needed, uh, didn't bankrupt the family. I had a hernia when I was eight. I went into hospital. It was fixed, didn't bankrupt the family. I got my grades. I went to university, didn't cost me a penny. Uh, see how old that I must am? have been so nice to you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> didn't cost me a penny. Um, my mum died when I was 19. I got more money to stay at university. Uh, my mum was a public sector worker, so she had a fairly decent pension. Uh, I graduated without any debt at all. I didn't just, I, like, it didn't cost me money and I got a grant. In a range of ways, primarily, that's before you get free school dinners and all that kind of stuff. So in, in a range of ways, class, those are class things, got me to a certain point. Um, the Guardian had set up a bursary scheme for non-white people and others who would be um, dissuaded from going into journalism. So there was a clear element of race there. And that was set up after, uh, in response to the, eight, the uprisings of the 80s and a sense that there aren't enough black journalists. It wasn't a job at The Guardian. It was just trained. We got, uh, they paid for us to do a course. Um, but then there comes a point, and you can see this played out in a range of ways, uh, drama, academia, literature, where Britain doesn't really know what to do with you. Mm. And at that point, lots of people leave. Paul Gilroy left, he's back. Uh, Carol Phillips, uh, Hazel Carby, they all went into academia. Yeah, uh, they were at Yale. Uh, Zadie Smith, um, Ben Carrington, um, who's at USC, Zadie's at NYU, I think. Um, uh, so there is, a, uh, and then when you get to the actors, oh yeah, uh, it's it's quite considerable. Um, and of course, America is a bigger place. You look at Daniel Kaluuya and you go, I'm so happy for you. Yeah. <laughs> like, I wish you were here. Like, yeah. I'm so happy you're getting the success that you clearly deserve, but come back. Yeah. Well, and quite often they do come back. They do yeah. end up coming back. But the, there are, um, um, there's, there's a significant amount of traffic at a certain stage in people's careers in, in, uh, in that direction, which... Um, makes sense, but it's also worth engaging with the fact that quite often, as was the case with me, and I went to America for 12 years, um, there were elements of what Britain is and can do that actually got us to the place where America would be even remotely interested in us. Well, a lot of the things you described, like being able to go to university, tuition free, um, reliable quality healthcare, these are things which either don't exist or are in decline. And I wonder if that's manifesting in a different attitude towards a kind of like very individualistic kind of social mobility, particularly amongst you know, younger black and Asian people. There's the sense of, well, nothing's looking after us, so I need to get my bag, I need to get my properties, I need to send money home, I need to look after my family. I'll be a landlord. Like, I know that my mom got screwed over by a landlord, but I'll be one because that means that I can establish myself on like a firmer foundation. I mean, I guess it's, you know, how do you as someone with very left-wing politics, someone who, you know, had been part of, you know, explicitly socialist movements, engage with that kind of language of, I've got to look out for myself and take care of my family and that's it. You know, it's a good question. And what, in these conversations, I'm very aware of my age and that I was formed in a different time. And so the one thing I try not to do, although my 10 year old daughter says I'm not very good at this, <laughs> is I try not to judge, actually, but to listen. That I, grew up during 
protracted downturn, having uh, in any kind of struggle, having older people talk about how useless younger people were. And I just found it irritating and off-putting. And, um, and a realization that kind of, well, this is the world you bequeathed to me. So you maybe want to think about that. What, you know, for all of the ways in which you, so, or we cannot have that conversation and we can talk about how things are different now. And so um, it's not that I don't have an opinion about some of those things, but that um, it is very fashionable for people of my age to ridicule um, Gen Zers and the kind of the, their solipsism and so on. And I just I try not to. Um, uh, and there are elements of the politics. It's not that I won't have the argument. It's not that I won't have the conversation, but that I'm kind of quite determined to uh, talk less and listen more because usually they're trying to tell you something. This organizer, these young people who are generally criticized for being solipsistic and um, um, oh, they're just into therapy and kind of themselves and oh, they're always looking at their phones. They organized bloody Black Lives Matter demonstrations with those phones. They were the people that came out. They were the kind of, um, they were the lifeblood of that moment. So um, uh, their understanding of issues around sexual orientation, gender equality, sex equality, um, uh, racism, are way more sophisticated than when I was growing up. So it, it's not some faux humble piece of nonsense. You like, I'm not trying to be the Dalai Lama. <laughs> I, I just it? love the Zoomers. <laughs> yeah. I just love the Zoomers. In, in the book, I, I interview Stormzy, and he's talking about the kind of money that he's the donations that he gives in kind of Oxford and, you know, elsewhere, his charitable work. And he says, I'm not fucking Gandhi. Do you hear me? <laughs> you know, <laughs> and it's, I'm not trying to be like the Dalai Lama and, and do a faux humility thing. If I'm interested in politics, then, then I have to learn things and that I consider for all of those things that I see that I'm uncomfortable with, it's not that I shouldn't be uncomfortable with them. It's not that I can't have a critique of them, but um, th that would be me trying to learn how this is being understood in this moment, because it's not in, in all likelihood going to be my generation that is going to make those radical changes. It's going to be their generation. So it's important for me to understand that, to understand them. I mean, I'm, I'm you know, being a millennial, I look at Zoomers and I feel older than Methuselah sometimes. <laughs> and I go, well, this is actually probably a healthy thing. Mm. It's a healthy thing to experience cultural change between my generation and another one. Um, but I, I worry that my generation and the younger generation is that you can talk about collective experiences, but only through the lens of the individual. So it's as a blah, blah, yeah. blah, blah, blah. And, you know, Margaret Thatcher in her Lenin phase was very much like economics is the method, the object mm. is to change the soul. And I worry about what growing up under, you know, a kind of like zombie neoliberalism has done to my soul and, and the souls of, of Zoomers. Yeah, I worry about that too. And, um, and, and yet often in different ways, I see flashes of solidarity, of collective struggle, let's go out there and do X, that suggests that it's, that it's more complicated, that not more complicated than what you're saying, but that it is complicated and that kind of, of course these things that we are raised with have an effect, we are a product in a range of ways of our time and our moment, um, but we are not only subject to those times and moments, there's also our, our kind of agency. And I see younger people doing all sorts of cool stuff that makes me think like, you know, that kind of does give me hope. So- What kind of cool stuff? Um, the way that, well, 
Black Lives Matter was pretty cool stuff. Th- the way that they have kind of um, um, that the electoral affinity to uh, Labour's left orientation, I thought was cool. Um, the attitudes around um, uh, s- sexism and uh, harassment uh, all feel like you know quite quite brilliant, and I I I, I feel hopeful. I, I I mean I'm cursed to feel hopeful. That is partly my want, but I don't I don't look at every generation, particularly of lefties that I've known, look on a generation that's coming after them and say, oh, yeah, (laughs) you know. It's not just, it wasn't like that in our day, which is true, but like, we were better. And um, um, we weren't, we were different. Some ways we were worse. Oh, in many ways, particularly my generation. I mean, we were just flailing around. We were trying to, like, and this, you know, there was a Stuart Hall, great moving right show. There was this kind of Thatcherism, Reaganism, the neo that neoliberal moment, then the collapse of the Soviet Union, the defeat. Of the, it hits like a steam train, and it's amazing that anyone is left standing. Basically, I mean, my my last question for you is is reading dispatches from the diaspora is that there are so many different political moments that you talk about, so many different flashes of culture. I mean, you're going from the end of apartheid to, you know, the rise of Stormzy. This is a huge period of time, so many different contexts. Um, What can white radicals, leftists, socialists learn from this political black diaspora that you're talking about? I guess that it it has its own dynamic and that dynamic has connections to the white world but isn't contingent on the right on the white world that you know Stormzy Maya Angelou there are a range of conversations and there are a range of moments in that book that take place without reference to racism or white people and that um uh and so the black diaspora has to be understood both within its complicated fluid autonomy but also as part of a kind of uh, uh of a wider world which is a different way of saying it's not all about you <laughs> right it's um it, and um and that's okay and that's okay and that kind of um if you look at right, there's a there's a moment in the my my Angelou interview, uh, which was my favorite. Um, I was supposed to have forty five minutes with her, and I got about thirteen hours and oh my God. rolled out of her uh, limousine, absolutely hammered. <laughs> it was a fantastic, fantastic day. But there's a moment in the interview, which is in the first forty five minutes, where she says something about. Um, finding a partner or something like that and she says you know um i believe i belong wherever human beings are she said i could fall in love with a sumo wrestler if he told me jokes and made me happy of course it's easier to fall in love with someone who's from your church and is down the road because you don't have to translate but i can translate and i'm willing to translate and i'm you know and i'm happy to if it's worth it and it was a, it was a beautiful exposition to me of a kind of um, I belong wherever people are, uh, um, and yeah, I think that there are a range of diasporas. This is this is one of them, and uh, and enjoy it for what it is. I mean, I think our next interview should be about the white diaspora because that's a, <laughs> it's a big one. It, well, it is a big one, and at times it's a it's a deeply conscious one, right? The mm. kind of when you when you look at those pictures of colonial Africa and it says Europeans only, well, it's not like British people considered themselves Europeans in any other way apart from when they were in Africa. I mean, the white diaspora is a real thing. People uh, they don't. White people don't recognize it as such until they show up in a place where they're in a minority and then they're 
totally looking out for each other or not looking out for each other to defend each other, but they then they completely notice each other and associate their existence with a set of assumptions and rise. It's something which I always notice when um, people come from other parts of the country to London and not everyone who doesn't live in London says this, so please Northerners don't bite my head off, but... Often something I'll hear is, and I was the only white person I could see because mm. they'll come to visit me mm. where I live in North London. I'm going, no, you're not. You're not the only white person you could see. And I know that, mm. right? Because Tottenham is gentrifying, mm. okay? Like you're not, but it's that feeling. Mm. And I'm so fascinated by it and I want to dig into it like, mm. a, like a brain surgeon with them, but I can't because I know that they'll never explain it to me yeah. the way they can explain it to each other and have that mutual recognition of suddenly feeling isolated in their whiteness because there's been like a critical mass of melanin that's been reached. And it doesn't mean they're racist, but they're no. feeling something. Yeah, well, it, it doesn't mean they're racist. It just it means that it, it illustrates a comfort that comes with being surrounded by people who you kind of, you know, associate with almost reflexively. I remember being in... America and going to uh, a friend of mine who was gay invited us to a party. His partner was black. Uh, so he invited me and my wife to this party. And uh, it was, he was the only white person and we were the only straight people. <laughs> it was a black gay party. It was a very American black gay party where a priest or pastor blessed the party before everybody got their groove on and so on. But it was, I remember thinking, oh, this is interesting. Like we are, uh, uh, the three of us, me, my partner and um, I, we, we are all outsiders in, um, uh, in our own way. I don't know if my wife was the only woman there. She might have been. But um, yeah, yeah. And you learn things. That's the thing. That's the, that, the thing about growing up as a feeling like an outsider is that it's not inevitable, but it offers you a critical eye that I could never grow up assuming that everything I was being told was true because I knew it wasn't because they were lying about me. I, you know, so I, I grew up sort of watching the news and thinking, yeah, you know, I don't know about that. Um, and, um, Sometimes I think, yeah, it must be weird to grow up thinking, watching the news and thinking, quite right too, you know, <laughs> and, um, and, and, and having your narrative constantly reinforced because my experience was almost completely the opposite. And while that was painful at times and while it took a lot of navigation, actually as a journalist and a critical thinker, it's very useful. I mean, are there tensions sometimes between that feeling of going, I know this isn't true and being a journalist where you can only say what you can prove because there are all sorts of things where I think the narrative which has been established as the official one is horseshit but I can't prove it and journalistic standards mean that I can't say it yeah I think that kind of um um you have to be able to you know things have to be evidence-based and um you are still able to offer, I think, one is still able to offer critique, which says, at the beginning of, when COVID kicked off, um, there was this suggestion that vitamin D, or lack thereof, was the reason why non-white people, or white black people in particular, but non-white people, were suffering more. It's also like we don't have rickets anymore. Like we <laughs> no. dealt with the vitamin D problem sometime <laughs> in the like 1960s. But it was like, at the beginning, Nobody knew, right? So I couldn't say, no. But I could say, well, it's also true for Latinos. It's also true for, uh, uh, it's particularly true for Bengalis. Uh, uh, it's Latinos in America, Africa. These are people with different exposures to vitamin D. So chances are, no, you know. Uh, but I didn't want to say, I couldn't just say, no. And it was one of those things that I felt coming right the way back to where we started. I felt that like I had to deal with. But so, yeah, I think that 
kind of um, the challenge when you know the dominant narrative is nonsense is to find a way to expose this nonsense. That's kind of like 90% of what we do, I think. Gary Young, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you.